Dominance and recessiveness are the two words that are most closely associated with genetics in most people's minds. And there's a couple reasons for that. Partly, um, understanding dominance is where our study and understanding of genetics began way back when Mendel um, started the field of genetics. And also, it's where most genetic educations begin, is with understanding dominance and recessiveness. And so that's great. The unfortunate side effect of that is that many people end up believing that all traits are controlled by a single gene that has a dominant and a recessive allele or a dominant and a recessive option. And the reality is that that's not the case at all. In fact, there are very few traits that are controlled by a single gene with only two alleles, one dominant and one recessive. In reality, most traits are controlled by many genes that all contribute some component of the trait and all interact in interesting ways. There are many other factors that interact with and affect genetic expression. So really, genetics is, is much, much more complicated. And I am not going to get into everything um, having to do with genetics because I can't. Uh, there are people who devote their entire lives to understanding and studying genetics. So it is not something that um, that I fully understand myself or would have any possibility of, um, even if I did, explaining it all to you in the matter of you know a couple of weeks uh, while we do this unit. However, it's really important that we spend some time to kind of broaden our minds and appreciate that there's much more to genetics than just dominant and recessive and uh, go through some examples of what that could look like. So we're going to start that today. Specifically today, we're going to talk about X-linked traits. And so by the end of this lecture, you'll be able to name some examples of X-linked traits and also be able to do Punnett squares and pedigrees using X-linked traits. So let's get into it. First of all, how is human biological sex determined? You might remember that humans have pairs of chromosomes. We have 23 to be specific. So we have 46 chromosomes in total. And there's one special pair that is called the sex chromosome pair. And that pair is what determines a person's biological sex. So in that pair of chromosomes, there's, there's two standard outcomes. If a person receives two X chromosomes, they are female. And if they receive one X and one Y chromosome, they are male. Now you might've noticed that I said standard outcomes because there are actually many other possibilities here. The majority of people get one of these two options, but there's a lot of people who receive something other than this, possibly one X and two Y chromosomes or two X and one Y chromosome or three X chromosomes. There's lots of different combinations of sex chromosomes. And we're going to get, I'm not getting into it right now because we're going to talk about that more when we talk about non-disjunction, which is a really um, interesting and important topic to discuss. Um, I just want you to know that this is not a hundred percent of people do not fall into one of these two categories, but the majority of people do. And that's kind of what we're going to operate on. Um, for understanding X-linked traits. Now, just to give you a little uh, exercise here, kind of stretch your minds and warm you up a little bit, um, who is responsible for determining the sex of an offspring? Is it the mother or the father? Give you a couple of seconds. You can pause the video if you need extra time to think. What do you think it is? If you said father you are correct. It is the father that determines the sex of an offspring because the mother, a female, has two X chromosomes and therefore can only give X chromosomes to their offspring. Whereas the father has an X and a Y chromosome and so there's a 50-50 chance. You might get an X chromosome from your father, in which case you are going to have two X chromosomes and be female, or you might get a Y chromosome and have an X and a Y chromosome and be male. So that's how, that's the basic genetic reason why our population is split about 50-50 between males and females, and uh, that's how sex is determined. So if, 
if you want to know who to blame, now you know. These are actual microscope images of X and Y chromosomes. And one of the things I want you to know is how different X and Y chromosomes are. X chromosomes are really large chromosomes. There's a lot of genes on these chromosomes, whereas Y chromosomes are relatively small. There's not a lot of genes there. Most of the genes on the Y chromosome are male-specific genes. They have to do with male development. But the X chromosome, X chromosomes are inherited by everybody, both males and females. So there's actually a lot of genes on the X chromosome that have to do with sex development, but also have to do with other things. So any gene that is on the X chromosome, we call it an X-linked gene because it is linked to the X chromosome. And like I said, there's a lot of genes that are involved with um, sex determination and sex, sex development on the X chromosomes, but there's also a lot of other genes related to other things. For example, there are a lot of genes on the X chromosome related to vision, and they, were all, they would all be X-linked genes. Now, let's imagine that we have a gene that is a dominant and recessive gene. So we're going to stick with that, that system for now. However, the gene is on the X chromosome. It's X-linked. So now suddenly, even with that very small variation, things got a lot more complicated because instead of just having dominant and recessive alleles, we have X alleles that have and carry the dominant allele. We have X gene, sorry, X chromosomes that carry the recessive allele, and we have Y chromosomes that don't carry an allele for the gene at all. Interesting. Which means that instead of the three standard outcomes of homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, and heterozygous, we now have five different outcomes. We could have a female with two X chromosomes, each of which carry the dominant allele. And so therefore they would be called homozygous dominant. We could have a female with two X chromosomes, one of which carries the dominant allele and one of which carries the recessive allele, in which case they'd be heterozygous. We could have a female that has two recessive alleles or two X chromosomes, both carrying recessive alleles, or we could have a male. Males are very different in this case because males only have one X chromosome. So they have an X and a Y chromosome. And if the male has the recessive allele on the X chromosome, notice they are not heterozygous or homozygous because they only have one copy of that gene. The Y chromosome does not have that gene on it. And the same goes for a male with a dominant allele. So this gets really, really interesting, right? And all the only thing that makes this different than a standard gene that has a dominant and a recessive allele is the fact that it's on the X chromosome. So you can see how genetic can, genetics can start to get very, very complicated, even when you just add small levels of complexity. Now let's talk about those males for a second because males only have one X chromosome and therefore they only have one allele for each of their X-linked genes, which means that the terms homozygous and heterozygous do not apply because heterozygous means one copy of each and homozygous means two copies of the same and they don't have two copies. So we need a new term here. We're gonna use the term hemizygous. So a male that has one copy of the dominant allele is called hemizygous dominant. And if they have one copy of the recessive allele, they're hemizygous recessive. Quick break here, quick thinking break. And I'm gonna ask you to pause the video and read this question and think about it and then only start the video when you have an answer in your mind for what you think it is. But red-green colorblindness is caused by an allele for an X-linked gene. So you may know that colorblindness is a lot more common in men than women, and I want you to think about why that is based on the fact that it is an X-linked gene. So pause the video, think about it, and then press play when you have an answer. Well, here's your answer. 
men only have one X chromosome. So basically, they get what they get. If they get a copy of the mutation or the recessive gene for colorblindness, then they are colorblind. If they get the dominant allele for normal vision, then they have normal vision. Whereas females have two X chromosomes. So you can almost think of it as like they have a backup. That's one way to think about it. If they get a colorblind gene on one X chromosome, they have a whole nother X chromosome that if they get the normal vision gene, they still have normal vision. Uh, or you can think about it how you can think of it as they have a the possibility of one of their genes masking the other gene. So because of this, there is a much, much greater chance for males to have recessive excellent traits such as colorblindness compared to females. Let's relate this X-linked inheritance pattern to Punnett squares and pedigrees. And we'll start with Punnett squares. So this question reads, gene B is an X-linked gene that is involved with vision. The dominant allele causes normal vision while the recessive allele causes red-green colorblindness. So make a Punnett square to determine the possible offspring genotypes that could result from a mother who is heterozygous for gene B and a father who is hemizygous dominant for gene B. Go ahead and pause the video, give this a try, and then press play when you're done. All right, let's do this together. Let's choose a fun color. How about like bright green? Okay, we're doing a Punnett square, but we're not just using one letter. We're going to use this whole X-linked uh, system that we just learned. So we have a mother who is heterozygous for gene B. So if it's a female, she's going to have two X chromosomes. And since she's heterozygous, she has one dominant and one recessive allele. So that is her genotype. We'll write that along one side of the Punnett square. The father is hemizygous dominant for gene B. So he has one copy of the dominant allele and a Y chromosome, right? He's hemizygous. So what are the possible outcomes here? Well, if we combine these in the middle here, that would result in a homozygous dominant female. This would result in a heterozygous female. This would result in a hemizygous dominant male. And this would result in a hemizygous recessive male. Make a planet square to determine the possible offspring genotypes that could result from a mother, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So, Basically, what we're looking at is if they have a daughter, she will have normal vision, right? Because she's either going to be homozygous dominant or heterozygous. If they have a son, then suddenly there's a 50-50 chance that that son might have colorblindness because they could either be hemizygous dominant or hemizygous recessive. So you can see just from this example right here, how it is much, much more likely for a male to inherit colorblindness than for a female to. Now let's try this with a pedigree. So make a family pedigree for the following family. Include their phenotypes and their genotypes with regards to X-linked gene B. So same gene from the last practice problem. If multiple genotypes are possible for the offspring, write down all possibilities. Ooh, that sounds like an adventure. I'm going to let you read this yourself. Again, pause the video, give this a shot, and then press play when you've got an answer. All right, well... Let's do this. How should we do this? I'm going to get a piece of paper. Mm, my document camera is not plugged in. We'll just have to do it as a over the top of this. We'll do a nice red. So we have a mother. And I apologize in advance that this is going to be a little bit sloppy. We have a mother 
who is homozygous dominant for X-linked gene B. So she has two copies of the dominant gene. The father is hemizygous recessive. So that tells us a couple of things. First of all, we are interested in the trait of colorblindness. So, so if we wanted to color this individual in, we could do that. And he is specifically hemizygous recessive. So he's going to be colorblind. They have two daughters and two sons. Wait a second. I'm going to draw this all the way down here. Two daughters. Whoa. And two sons. I apologize for the sloppiness here. Wait, they didn't tell us anything else about them. So how are we supposed to figure out their genotypes and phenotypes? Well, let's think about it. Maybe we should do a Punnett square here. If we do a little Punnett square, we can determine what the possible outcomes are for these two parents. Oh, this is tricky. I'm sure that this is just fascinating for you to watch. All right, so basically, if we look here, between these two parents, there's only one possible genotype for female offspring, right? And for male offspring. If they have a female, it's going to be a heterozygous female. So that means that both of these females have the heterozygous genotype and therefore have normal vision, right? Both of the males, this is the only possible male outcome, so both of the males have this outcome. And I wouldn't normally do this drawing arrows. I'd really like you to write the genotypes next to each individual like I've done up here, but just to save time, I wanted to do that. So again, getting back to pedigrees for a moment, the pedigree allows us to predict what the genotype outcomes are going to be. Um, for these individuals and, and to determine what their genotypes are, even though we might not necessarily know. We really only know for sure information about the parents, but from that we can determine what the genotypes of the offspring are going to be. So basically all of their offspring will have normal vision. However, both of their daughters are carriers for the colorblind trait. So they have the possibility of potentially having offspring who are colorblind because they have that recessive allele. All right. That was a doozy. So since we're talking about colorblindness, um, I want to just show you some images that I find really interesting. Um, I'm going to come back for a second here that I find really interesting, uh, that kind of give you some perspective as to what it might be like to be colorblind. And I want to say right off the bat that I, I recognize that, uh, some of you watching may be colorblind. And so um, I, I don't mean this as an offense to anybody, um, for, for, but for people who are not colorblind, uh, this can give you some appreciation and some some sympathy for um, what, what that can be like. So here's a picture of a set of colored pencils um, with normal vision. It looks like a rainbow of colored pencils, but there are the other reason that I want to show you this is to show you that there are multiple types of color blindness. So d depending on what mutated gene you got and what how the mutation occurred um, and what your total kind of genetic outcome is, there are a number of different ways that you can be colorblind. There's not only one type of color blindness. So um, probably the most common type of color blindness is red-green weakness or red-green color blindness, 
which another term for that, the technical term is protonopia. And this, that's, this is what this set of colored pencils would look like to a person who has that visual um, mutation. Pretty interesting. Um, there's also other types of color blindness you can see down here. Um, it, it is true. Some people, it's it's pretty rare, but there are some people who cannot see color. They only see black and white. And so that's what it would look like down here. Um, here's just some other images that kind of give you a, a similar a similar perspective. Um, green, yellow, and red apples to a person with red-green color blindness kind of all look like yellowish apples. Food would look very different if you had um, color blindness or if you do have color blindness. Uh, not to say that it would necessarily taste any different, but it definitely would have a different look to it. And this one, oh boy, think about that for a second. Seems like it could be kind of a safety issue, right? A lot of people who are colorblind, um, instead of remembering red, yellow, green, they remember the position of um, the, the lights at traffic lights to remember which one means stop and which one means go and which one means warning. Um, but you could see how this would be a potential problem if there was a, a different type of um, traffic light out there that maybe had them in a different order or in reverse order. That could be dangerous. And in fact, I think that there are co countries where the standard order of the lights is reversed. So that's potentially a hardship. Um, for, that people with colorblindness have to have to be aware of. Um, this may have been a good thing for, you know, um, our traffic, what would you call us? Our The forefathers of our traffic laws to think about um, before they decided that red, yellow, and green would be the colors used for this. Maybe like, should use something else. Um, now, if you are curious, whether you have colorblindness and you want to maybe get a little bit more information about that, or if you just want to see what a colorblindness test looks like if someone were to go and, and you know, get tested for colorblindness, um, I, I would encourage you to check out this link here. It's a, it's a pretty good online colorblindness test. It's actually put out by a company that is trying to sell um, glasses that, that they claim help people with colorblindness to see more color. So you don't have to pay or buy anything in order to use the test. And it's a pretty good system, but just be aware of that. Um, there's also other tests out there that you can take. And if you'd like to think about these questions, um, and if you'd like to send me a message or, or send any of your instructors a message uh, discussing this, or if you have any other questions, um, feel free to contact us. So at this point, hopefully you are aware of what X-linked inheritance is. You can list some examples of X-linked traits, and you can um, use pedigrees and Punnett squares to track the genetic inheritance of X-linked traits. So I hope you enjoyed that lecture, and I hope you come back and listen to our future lectures. And until next time, peace out.